Hello, my name is John Marion of Common Cause, Rhode Island. Welcome today to today's forum, sponsored by the Warwick Beacon and WJAR Channel 10. Uh, this hour-long forum uh, with the Republican candidates for mayor, incumbent Scott Evadesian, and Ms. Stacy Petrie, uh, is intended to give mm -hmm. September 9th primary voters insights into the platforms of each of the candidates and what they consider to be the issues facing the city of Warwick. The forum will follow a debate format designed to give the candidates the opportunity to outline their priorities and to respond to the comments of their opponent. Our panel uh, consists of John Howell, the editor and publisher of the Warwick Beacon, and Bill Rapp, the political reporter at Channel 10. They will be asking the questions. Our timer is Mr. Tim Forsberg of the Warwick Beacon. The candidates will be given two minutes for opening statements. By draw straws, Ms. Petrie has won uh, the chance and elected to uh, give the opening statement, in which case, the first opening statement, in which case she'll also give uh, the uh, final closing statement. Yeah. Questions from the panel will be asked in no particular sequence, although uh, I, as moderator, have the power to be selective should I feel the questions are being weighted uh, to one candidate over the other. Uh, I will also have the power to cut short the candidates should they exceed the allotted time. The candidates will be given 90 seconds to respond to a question. The, candidates, the candidate not asked the question can choose uh, whether to comment uh, on that response with 90 seconds. And if, uh, if that is the case, then there is a 30 second rebuttal uh, by the candidate who was originally asked the question. <clears throat> In the case of follow-up questions from the panelists, uh, the same timing, 90 seconds, 90 seconds, and 30 seconds will be followed. Candidates will be given the opportunity to ask one another, uh, excuse me, ask their opponent midway through the debate the question. Uh, I have the authority to determine if the question is appropriate, and if so, the opposing candidate will have 90 seconds to respond, followed again by the 90 second uh, rebuttal and the 30 second rebuttal. Five minutes before the end of the debate, uh, the hour-long debate, the timer will indicate to me uh, that we need to wrap up the questions, and I will begin this sequence of the closing statements. First, a quick word about decorum. We understand the high stakes of this election, and the future of the city depends much on the leadership of the city. Uh, we regret that because of scheduling, we were, were not able to plan the debate at a time when greater attendance was possible. Channel 10 is live streaming this debate, as in the uh, Warwick Beacon will also have it on its website. We ask uh, that those in attendance uh, hold their applause until after the candidates have made their closing statements. So with that, I'd like to get underway. Uh, and so Ms. Petrie, uh, we'll begin with your opening statement, please. Thank you. Hi, my name is Stacia Petrie, and I want to thank John Howell of the Warwick Beacon, Bill Rapoli of Channel 10, and John Marion of Common Cause for giving me this opportunity to describe my vision for Warwick in the future. Warwick needs a new direction, and that's why I've declared my candidacy to run as mayor of Warwick in this September 9th primary. I bought my home in 2006, and I'm startled that I've had eight years of tax increases. I want people to realize that I'm not here to criticize the mayor. I'm here, I, the mayor is an individual. I'm here to discuss his policies and why I think I have a better uh, vision for the future of Warwick. The issues I hope to discuss today are the following. 14 years of property tax increases, roads filled with potholes, crumbling school buildings and the lack of dialogue between the mayor and the school committee, city worker benefits that have to be reviewed, and increasing sewer bill costs. This is just a brief outline of the topics that must be discussed today because the Warwick taxpayers want answers. To the senior citizens that can't be sitting in this room today, I'm here for you. To the children that will be starting school in a couple of weeks with leaking roofs and crumbling, crumbling stairways, I promise as mayor, next year you will not be confronting that issue. To the Warwick residents who are concerned about the costs associated with new sewer construction projects, I will be honest with you about what the actual costs will be. My administration's hallmark will be openness and transparency. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you to Bill and John for uh, putting this debate on. I'm Scott Abedijan, the mayor of the city of Warwick. And in the time that I have been mayor, we have posted a surplus nearly every year. We have paid more than $58 million in school improvements. We've been paying down the city's bonded indebtedness 
and we have invested in our quality of life by protecting and preserving Rocky Point. At the same time, we have created City Center Bullock, a train station, and presided over real economic development. A revitalized Woolwick Mall, new plans to turn Rhode Island Mall into a factory outlet mall. And we have welcomed exciting new businesses such as Jordan's Furniture, Trader Joe's, Jared Jewelers, CarMax, the Hilton Garden Inn, Ironworks Tavern, and the corporate headquarters of Coastway Community Bank. In addition, both Ocean State Theater Company and Salve Regina University have opened in the train station district. There is much more work to be done, and I look forward to the next two years to continue to make Woolwick a great place to work, to live, and to raise a family. Thank you, and we'll begin with the questions. Uh, yeah. John Howell. I, I thought I'd start off and ask you whether you're going to take the bucket challenge. <laughs> <laughs> but I figured I'd break the ice with a question on Rocky <laughs> Um As you both know, thanks to the efforts of the federal government, state, and city, Rhode Island voters, especially during a, a, a bond issue, the 124-acre Rocky Point property which was once proposed as a site for 399 housing units, will be preserved as public space. As you also know, the Rocky Point Foundation played a role in placing the Rocky Point question on the ballot. First, I want to correct any misconception that the foundation is an arm of the city administration. It is not. More important, now that the city and the state have the land, is what is going to happen going forward. Would each of you share your vision for the park and how this relationship between the city, which owns 41 acres, and the state that remains, that owns the rest of it, should play out? So, Mayor, maybe you'd start. Yeah. Um, well, John, as you know, Rocky Point uh, has been a project for the last 14 years. Um, the first acquisition at Rocky Point was the 41 acres of coastline um, that was acquired by the city with the help of the federal government um, and um, NOAA, out of uh, DEM, NOAA, and the city. And that agreement um, provides for no development on that 41 acres. We've created a walking path of a mile long all the way along the shore. One of the only times that a community has been able to really um, purchase a full mile of coastline. And so that is now open again after it was closed for just a short period of time while demolition of some of the other property um, was being done. In the same time, the state put a bond issue out for 81 and a half or 81 and three quarter acres of land um, that's now in control of the state. That land is being um, cleaned right now to be developed into a park. There is some discussion. Um, DEM will have to uh, work through all of that. But there's some discussion about a banquet facility and a restaurant. Um, the fishing piers will be on the ballot this November as a bond issue. And I think um, that kind of passive and active uh, use of the property will well suit and will benefit the people of, of the state of Rhode Island and the city of Wall for years to come. Uh, I've spoken I, on the campaign trail. I've been uh, in the Warwick Neck area, and I've had uh, personal conversations with the homeowners there. And uh, what they, the concerns that they bring up and the questions are, how will uh, this development, development bring in revenue? And um, they also are concerned about um, what type of, uh, if it'll be a family attraction, if it will be safe. There's already garbage and litter um, in the area. And they have concerns about safety and vandalism, as uh, was recently uh, written as to what happened uh, with the equipment there doing the work. And uh, I have a, a greater vision for Rocky Point. Um, I would have to meet with the state agencies and, and talk about my ideas as well as meet with the, uh, the community. And uh, I would like to see it um, definitely be a revenue driver. I would like to see it incorporate an attraction that um, would be very inviting for children and uh, for families. And uh, to have it just simply developed um, with no set plan in place, um, I think it deserves more. It's a prime piece of property. And uh, whether it's an aquarium or utilizing our waterways uh, to bring people in, uh, maybe even a, a private taxing service is something I would like to look at. Uh, but again, in talking with the people in that community, they would like to see something more done with Rocky Point. 
And since the question is directed uh, to you both, uh, you have the opportunity, you don't have to avail yourself of it, to uh, give a 30 second uh, response or rebuttal. Uh, sure. Mayor. Thanks, Jim. Uh, I would just like to, to publicly thank the Rocky Point Foundation, a group of individuals that came together, um, not connected to city or state government, to advocate for the preservation of Rocky Point. Um, it has been an incredible tourist attraction thus far, um, and you see the number of people who are down there walking the path each and every weekend, uh, and many beautiful mornings. Um, the issue of development there is, has pretty much been decided because there are uh, covenants in all of the agreements that were done um, to only allow limited development. Ms. Petrie, would you like to add anything else? Uh, no, I would. Thank you. So we'll begin with our uh, second question from Bill Radley. All right, and I'll address this to Ms. Petrie. And that is the uh, City of Warwick has a tiered tax system different for, court, for business than it is for residential. Do you think that that is something that is uh, a detriment to attracting businesses? And while we're talking about that tax policy, do you think there should be in the city center a different tax rate than there is in the rest of the city? I think what is a detriment to the small business owners in Warwick uh, is the 14 years of continued nonstop tax increases. And when I, and I've been out and I've visited uh, several, and what they're telling me is that even over an eight year period, I've talked to some business owners where their taxes have more than doubled. They've gone from 7,000 to even close to over 14,000. And what's happening is it's, it's driving the small business owners right out of Warwick and Rhode Island. And my concern is to hold the line on tax increases on the city. I think before we can uh, be looking at a tiered tax system and whether or not it's viable um, or how detrimental it is, we have to take a look at uh, the responsibility of the leadership within our own city and how we're going to control spending so that we alleviate the burden on the small business owners. Yeah. Um, Bill, I think the question was about the tier tax system that currently exists. I did not favor that when it was put before the city council uh, prior to the time that I was mayor. Um, I didn't agree with it then. I thought a homestead exemption was the better way to go and have one rate for both uh, residential and commercial. Uh, I was on the losing end of that vote. Um, when I became mayor, we did a study to see if you could reverse that decision. And unfortunately, at, at that point, after several years of having um, a tier tax system, the jump was going to be way too high um, because you've set up this year after year of the change in, in the different uh, formula and the percentages we use. And so it almost made it impossible to go to a one rate system again, even with the um, homestead. We have annually reviewed that as to whether or not it's doable, but as the years go by, it's made it more and more difficult. But I did not favor that when it was first proposed. I favored a 10 plus 10 plan that was um, the alternative at that time. So um, neither of you got to the other thing about that city center district. Should that have a separate tax structure, do you think, Ms. Petrie? I, I would, again, it, it all comes back to uh, looking at the investor, uh, you know, the interest in developing in, that, in the land there and in the property. And um, we, we don't see investors knocking on our doors to want to engage in any type of development in that area. It hasn't even been built up to what it can be. And again, it all comes back to um, the <coughs> massive amount of taxes associated with operating businesses um, anywhere in the city of Warwick. And I bring it back again to the tax burden. And right now, small businesses are heavily burdened by tax increases in the city. So nothing special in the city center? No. Mayor? Bill, I think we, um, we have already seen some success there. The Hilton Garden Inn was a former brownfield site that was contaminated. It is now an income-producing hotel that um, just last month had over 96% uh, occupancy on Friday and Saturday nights alone, and 83 or 84% during the whole month. Um, the Ironworks Tavern um, is a, a well-functioning and very successful uh, business there as well. Uh, we have had talks about whether you need to do um, 
some kind of tax treaties there. I think that the issue with the Commerce Commission has really been we need to put our investment into the infrastructure there to get the sites ready for development rather than um, looking at tax treaties. So that's where we have put all of our focus. And thus far, um, expect uh, another announcement uh, for Jefferson Boulevard in the next two weeks. There we go. Yeah, I think um, we'll do 30 second responses. Um, so, so. Uh, no matter what type of development we're looking at for that area, what it comes back to is that we have a significant amount of debt in the city of Warwick. We're at almost $800 million in debt, and our, the tax increases for it, it doesn't matter how many big businesses you can bring into Warwick. The fact of the matter is we're getting taxed 14 years in a row and small businesses are getting taxed straight out of the city of Warwick. And with all of the big businesses we have, what we're seeing is still 14 years of tax increases and the tax burden on, on the small businesses. And um, regardless of what's happening here, if we don't take care of the spending on the city side, uh, um, developments like this, they, won't, they won't, wouldn't be feasible. Yeah. My rebuttal would be that just in the last few weeks, Bill, you've seen the Rhode Island Mall announce a major redevelopment. Jared Jewelers coming here for the very first location in this area. CarMax coming here for their first location. Um, you see a revitalized Warwick Mall. Um, I think that we can demonstrate that our economic development is growing here in this city. Ocean State Theater, Salve Regina, um, Coastway Community Bank moving their corporate headquarters here, all within the last month making major announcements like that. Thank you. Uh, next question we'll have uh, John Howell. Yes, uh, Petrie, you threw out a figure on that response, uh, 800 million in debt. Uh, could you break that out and, you know, so the, the voters here understand what you're talking about. Is mm -hmm. this something we need to pay off immediately? What? What does it consist of? What it consists of is the debt associated with our general obligation bonds our unfunded pension liabilities, our unfunded health care liabilities. It's a combination of the, the, the city, the schools, water, and sewer. And it's associated bond debt and also unfunded pension liability debt. And right now, if you take a look at Warwick's grand total debt, it's at almost $781 million. And the per capita debt, this is on each household, we're at almost $10,000 for every household in the city of Warwick. My, my response, John, would be um, that currently in this existing fiscal year, city fund bonds in gen out of the general fund uh, are at $46 million. Um, that's what our, the city debt in its entirety is. There is sewer debt, but that's paid by ratepayers. And then there are a number of other debts that are out there. Um, but I think when you add that all together, it really just clouds the issue of what our bonded indebtedness is. When Standard & Poor's just reviewed um, the city of Warwick, they gave us um, extra points based on our bonded indebtedness rate and said that it was low for a community our size. I have a response. Okay. Moody's ha actually has downgraded uh, the city of Warwick's uh, ratings and the outlook is still remains uh, uh, negative. And um, when you take a look at the rate payers, um, when you look at how much uh, Warwick residents have paid for their sewer bills and their water bills, the rates have doubled actually over the past six years. And what's happening is that we have a major lack of oversight, management, and planning on the side of the city. And we see outstanding debt for total bond and debt at $160 million. We see our property taxes increasing 14 years in a row. Our rates are doubling. And um, that's why our grand total debt, and if you take a look at it, yeah, sorry. Sure. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Let's maybe do we have a, a different? Well, we seem to have two figures here: the mayor's figure and your figure in terms of differences. And uh, when I started the question, I was really looking for a sort of breakdown of that 800 million. Mm -hmm. uh, I can give you a copy of the work debt analysis if you'd like. We have plenty we've been giving out to the public. But you know, I think there's maybe I'm misconstruing it and maybe the mayor can correct this or shed light on it, but it seems like there's there's a war of debt in terms of what we owe on our bonds and what you're talking about in terms of pension liabilities, which seems to be added on to that figure. Is that correct? Yes, we have a big major debt problem. 
associated with what is outstanding and, and, and the debt that is being burdened. We have a, a big taxpayer burden with overall debt. So what we're not doing and what we haven't seen for 14 years is control and spending. That's why, the, that's why we have $246 million in city unfunded health care liabilities. We have a $50 million outstanding general obligation debt, and I understand part of that $16 million is for the schools, and you have another $34 million associated with, with the city. And uh, I, I don't think it, you know, we see that there, there, there is no set plan. We have never in 14 years seen any cuts in spending on the side of the city. And that's why all of our taxes, if you look at the 10-year change in spending for all new tax dollars coming from our taxpayers, we have an 80% change over 10 years. All of our tax, do tax dollars are going into city uh, retiree expenses. So that's the big problem. So I'd like to give the mayor one last chance on this, and then maybe we'll move on to a different subject if yeah. we're only an hour and, and a lot of different topics. John, we each and every year, um, we have an actuarial report that comes in where experts review uh, our pensions and tell us what we need to fund the following year. We have consistently funded everything that they have told us to do. We also have an audit that's done each and every year, and there are recommendations made as to how we should report, how we should manage, um, and how we should better um, look at the city's financial picture. We follow all their recommendations. I can tell you that you can create pie charts and, and graphs in your kitchen table, I would rather have the experts in the field um, come in and consistently give us advice as to how we're managing our debt, how we're managing our finances, and take their advice and move forward. Can I have a response to that? Actually, I, yes, uh, I said I'd like to sure. move on just because we've, I think, played that out quite a bit. And, okay. and also keep in mind you'll both have the chance for a closing statement to incorporate um, some of the issues that have been covered. Uh, maybe Bill, uh, Rapley, do you have a? Yeah, let's. Um, uh, I guess uh, the mayor gets this one to start, but it's to both of you. And that is uh, more of a, a general question about when you are confronted with problems. Uh, I'd like you to tell me who are your trusted advisors and how do you use them when you try to come up with solutions? Well, I think the first thing is to not make a knee-jerk reaction and to let a little bit of time go by and to really process what's going on. My cabinet, I think, is some of the best employees um, around. We have incredible wisdom and incredible institutional knowledge about this city. So I rely on um, our police chief. Uh, Steve McCartney has been a long-term veteran of this city. Our fire chief, Ed Armstrong. Um, our public works director, my chief of staff, our planning director. We will get everyone around the table and, and talk about an issue and say, how is, what is the best way of solving this problem? I'm a big believer in the more information you have uh, and the more discussions that you that take place, the better an answer you're going to have. Patrick, can you address the same who, question? Who will you consult with when you are confronted with issues that you need to make decisions about? I, I would first make sure that I have qualified individuals, uh, professionals operating my city departments. And I would meet with them, but I would also take the time and to get the feedback from the public. And the one thing that I've seen uh, attending city council meetings and observing, uh, the there's a very big disconnect between our leadership and the public. And we've had very concerned citizens coming forward year after year, presenting these numbers, presenting their concerns, talking about the, the crumbling schools, the potholes that are just completely lining our roads. And uh, that's what I've been doing when I'm out there campaigning. I want to hear what the people have to say. And I think that's very important that there be a two-way dialogue. We don't have that in the city of Warwick. We have the public that speaks to the city council, and we don't get a response. And uh, so again, I, you know, I think um, you know, not having a knee-jerk reaction includes making sure I have qualified people that I'm meeting with on, on the city side and definitely including the feedback from the public. Thank you. So we'll have 30 seconds for each of you if you, if you choose, uh, beginning with the mayor. I would just say that I think we have very qualified people who are in our departments. They have been there, most of them have been there um, for a long period of time know the issues, know how to respond. Um, there is no community uh, in Rhode Island, um, obviously I'm, I'm a little bit of 
not, not overly objective about that. But I think uh, our employers are incredibly dedicated to the job. Thank you. Ms. Petrie? I have nothing further to say. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, let's, we're going to shift to schools. Um, and uh, approximately the same number of students is enrolled in Cranston <coughs> schools as well as in Warwick. Yet in Warwick, the budget is $25 million more than in Cranston. And Cranston operates two high schools and two middle schools, whereas you know Warwick operates three of each. Uh, <clears throat> what do each of you think needs to happen with Warwick schools, if, if anything? Is it a matter of money? Too much or too little governance leadership and as a sidebar to that would you support a charter school too so the last question began uh, with mayor of Dijon, so maybe we'll begin with uh, this time mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, i think that it involves all of those uh, qualities we we need to have leadership is, is it finance i mean we look at the schools over the past three years they've been level funded and uh, if, you, if you look at uh, the amount of ta tax dollars being appropriated to the schools, they're significantly lower than the side of the city. Um, we've only allocated $1 million, 3.2% over the last, last six years in tax dollars uh, to the schools. And uh, when it came down to consolidation, that was looked at. Uh, the mayor's uh, uh, chief planner uh, took a very good look at that. And when it came down to consolidation, the mayor, we had lack of leadership. The mayor was not present. He was nowhere to be found when all of those uh, uh, families and students were in that school auditorium uh, and they were expressing their concerns. And uh, as, as a leader and as mayor, I would have been there, I would have been present, and I would have expressed why it needed to happen and how we could, uh, savings could be allocated back uh, so that we could do more for the children in the schools. John, the population in those schools has dropped down to just about 9,100, and I think the figures for this year are 9,163 students that have enrolled thus far um, going into September. Obviously, with 23 buildings, um, it's difficult to maintain all of them um, when some of the buildings are less than half, um, at half capacity. What I said to the school committee was, if they went forward with any consolidation plan, and I didn't choose schools for them to close, it's not my role. I, talked to them, I worked with them. I did not endorse a plan because I didn't think it was right for me to choose what schools that they should put on the chopping block. We did have discussions about the merits of each building and how much money would have to go in to fix a building. We did look at what the capacity was, but they came up with a plan. I said that if they went forward and adapted that plan, all of the money that they would, would save would be reinvested into the school department. I know there was some concern uh, that maybe the city council didn't allocate that same amount of money if they were showing that they were cutting uh, their overall costs. Um, I went and met with the city council and told them that I would recommend that they keep all the savings to reinvest in the programming that um, needs to be implemented in our schools. Yeah, I'm sorry. Great, yeah, so we'll, okay. we, um, we don't have time for each okay. to have 30 seconds. I think the responsibility of a mayor when it comes to, the mayor claims that it was difficult to maintain the safety of the school buildings, but in 2006, the pu public voted on a $25 million bond to be allocated to make sure that our schools, were, our buildings are safe, and uh, they were up to fire code. And the mayor sat on that $25 million bond until it came down to the day where the schools were forced to near closure because they weren't up to fire code. And what en ended up happening is that the schools ended up taking, they're the ones responsible now for that $25 million bond. They're paying principal and interest. I don't think it's fair that the school system would be responsible for any type of city bond that should have been allocated to fix these crumbling buildings. Thank you. Uh, Mayor, 30 seconds. My opponent is not correct on that. Um, Right now in the current budget, $5 million is allocated on the city side of the budget to pay for school bond, debt principal, and debt interest. Um, there is $11 million out of the $25 million that has already been utilized by the school. There's only $14 million left in that. That money has not even been realized yet, so in order to, to just say that the money is sitting there waiting to be um, spent is not correct. Um, we authorize debt each year by the city depending on how much we are paying off. 
I would disagree with the mayor. Um, uh, so uh, we're near halfway uh, of our hour-long debate, so mm -hmm. this is your opportunity to ask each other a question. Um, since uh, Ms. Petrie uh, got to go first and choose, uh, chose that position by drawing straws, I'd like to begin with the mayor and allow you to ask your first sure. question. My question would be that my opponent has talked um, a lot about um, reinvesting millions of dollars into different programming than I am doing. So my question would be, which four or five line items specifically would you favor cutting in order to your, do your spending program? Thank you. you have 90 seconds for first. Yes. Um, I, I'm not the mayor. I don't, I don't have the line items in the budget in front of me right now. But I do know that when the city council this year found a million dollars in saving in this year's budget, um, the, the mayor vetoed that, vetoed those savings. And that's the first veto since 2004. And what my main prior, priority is, before we can reinvest back, we have to take a look at um, what exactly it is on how we're spending. Uh, we have, again, we have no clear proposed, when, when we're going out, when, if, if it's the work sewer authority that's constructing new sewers, we don't even have a plan. Uh, when it comes down to, uh, we, we take a look at, I believe in zero-based budgeting. I don't believe in taking a look at what we spent and what we think we're going to spend the following year. I'm a believer in taking a look at what we spent, did it work, and if we didn't get the return on our event, it, investment, then we would go ahead and maybe put a line through that, that, that item in the budget. So we have to take a look at how we're spending and, find, and go through the budget with a fine-tooth comb and make sure that before we even think about increasing taxes again on the war of taxpayers, that we have, we have properly gone through our city budget. Thank you. Mayor? Um, John, I would just say that um, not one specific line item was mentioned um, that would be cut in order to pay for all of these new programs that my opponent has suggested. I would possibly, I have actually have a response. Um, I think I would take a look at uh, the position in the custodial position in the police department that was created. Um, I think I would start there, most likely. Now we're going to switch okay. switch roles. Uh, Ms. Petrie, your your question. Mm -hmm. Mayor Adedijan, what criteria do you use to evaluate whether or not a city department is running efficiently? We have a number of different criteria that we use. Number of work orders that are processed. Um, we look at whether or not uh, employees' um, attendance is high. That's usually an indication of uh, some problem in an department. We look at the overall uh, sick use. Um, we look at if there's any comp time that's built up. We look at whether or not there are citizen complaints that are being received about that, that department. Um, we have regular meetings with our department directors to get their feedback and regular meetings with employees to get their feedback. The biggest way that we get to know whether or not a department is working or not is a switchboard at City Hall that definitely lets us know when there's a problem. Yes. Uh, Mayor, with all due respect, I don't understand your answer. Uh, you created a new supervisor custodial position at the police station that wasn't necessary. The job was being done adequately by the department building maintenance for years. That new supervisor position only oversees just one custodian, and that position is costing the taxpayers approximately $70,000 a year in salary and benefits. And now we learn that supervisor is married to your campaign manager. Well, How do you justify that to hardworking war I, taxpayers? I can justify that because it's not a new position, Ms. Petrie. It is a transferred position from building maintenance now solely into the police department to do mm -hmm. just that person and that one other custodian in the building so that no one else from building maintenance has to go there at all. Okay. Thank you. So we're back to the panel. Uh, and the panelists. Did you get a so it was 90. She's got 30 seconds. Uh, she she 30 90, seconds. 90, 30. 30. 30. Yeah. 30. She's got a rebuttal. She's got a rebuttal. Okay. I, I just want to clarify with the mayor. So for the record, you're saying that that new custodial position at the police station was a transfer and it was not created. That's correct. Okay. Um, so back to the panel. Um, <coughs> who's this question go to, John? Uh, did, did your discretion either vote? 
fair. Yeah. <laughs> I think we've been roughly balanced so far. Most questions have been um, Well, I know uh, the, we talked a little bit earlier about uh, expenses in the city and indebtedness, and there was a reference to pensions and the uh, OPEX for the retirees. So I guess we'll, well, let's start with you, Ms. Petrie. How do you uh, suggest that the, the pension costs be trimmed? If we're talking specifically about health care? No, just the retirees' benefits, I, pension and health care. Sure, absolutely. Um, they first need to, uh, the retirees, um, and I've met with several when I've been out campaigning, they don't even understand what the numbers are. They don't even, they, they, they have uh, no clear understanding on that. And I think the first thing is that it's very important to meet with their retirees and have them have a very clear understanding at just what the situation is with these unfunded pensions and health care liabilities. Uh, right now, Warwick taxpayers pay $8 million a year for retiree health care and the retirees are paying nothing. I think a fair place to start would be to bring the retirees in, have them understand what the numbers are, how the funding of these four different, four different pension plans are actually declining, and uh, you know, ask the fair questions about health care, shared health care costs, because active employees are paying for health care, teachers are paying for health care, small businesses pay, pay a lot for health care. And I think it's a very fair question when we look at unfunded health care liabilities uh, between the schools and the city. Well, the, even the city loans at almost $247 million. I think I think now is the time to, to start asking these questions. And Bill, this is for both candidates. Yeah, this it is. Question. But, okay, so, but all I heard is that you want to meet with the retirees and tell them how bad the situation is. Mm -hmm. what, how will you reduce the payments? How will, you, how will you reduce the pension liabilities? We have to we have to meet with the retirees. Okay, we have to first open up the books and get the real numbers because it seems like these are actuarial numbers, and the mayor will say that these numbers aren't accurate. So I think the first thing to do is look. I'm not mayor. It's taken 14 years for for these numbers to 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 be reflected <coughs> what they are. And uh, I think it's very important that the books get opened. We know what the numbers are. Get the professionals at the table. Meet with the retirees, and then talk about why do we have, uh, for example, we have um, some retirees in one pension plan getting a cola, and we have cola freezes in another pension plan. There's many different questions that need to be asked. We have we have our active city employees who haven't even received a raise in three years. We have some retirees getting a right. three percent cola I think every year. Bill, I think your question was the pension plans. We have four in the state in the city. Those four plans are police one and fire one, which is an old closed plan. Um, that is the one that's problematic. That's the one that has um, a 40-year funding formula that we're now in year 18 of. Um, and then the other three pension plans, which is municipal is funded at 70 percent, fire two is funded at 83 percent, and police two is funded at 81 percent. They are the three highest funded municipal pension plans in the state, and they are all qualified as tier one plans. The state went through and ranked every municipal pension plan in the entire, for all communities in the entire state. We are the only ones that are in tier one. The fourth pension plan is the one that's problematic. That is the old um, closed plan um, that for years no one funded anything into. Years ago we created a 40 year funding formula for that, long before any other community was creating funding plans. The tradition today would be a 30 year funding formula. So we spent time with the Auditor General last year trying to figure out whether it would be better for us to go into a 30-year plan. Quite honestly, the Auditor General came back and said, you have an adopted plan that you're funding. Why would you add eight more years worth of payments on it? So out of the, well, your question is about pensions. We have four plans, three of them tier one um, in the state, the highest rank in the entire state. Yeah, I'd like to maybe just. It's part of the rebuttal, could I just like, uh, uh, put the question down a little bit? Okay. Um, Peter, would you, uh, ask that the pension plan no longer include, the, I think this is the plan that's, that's uh, in the 40 years. She should just be like that. Hang on, no, the audience, please. Sure. I, I'd like to respond to what the mayor just said yeah, first. Yeah, we'll give her time okay. to respond to this, plan, and she can add her right. comment. Uh, it includes the provision that any raises going to current workers also apply to the retirees. 
would you um, make any effort to uh, change that? Absolutely. If we have retirees getting a 3% COLA and active city workers not getting a raise and they haven't received a raise, these are our police, our firefighters, our city workers who haven't received a, a raise in, in, in years. And I think it's very fair that we come to the table and take a look at, we have people on Social Security at a 1.5% COLA, we have veterans getting a 1.5% COLA. So our active city workers get no raise, and we have some, some people who are retired city workers who get a 3% COLA. I think it would be a very fair question to bring people to the table. And as far as the police and fire one pension plan goes, we have four pension plans. If you look at what's been happening to them over five years, they're actually, when it, and, and, and their funding ratio, it's declining, and it's gone down by 7%. And just for police and fire one alone, it'll cost taxpayers four, $314 million for one pension plan, police and fire one, to fund it less than 3% over the next 14 years. So we have some, we have some very big concerns going on here with Thank the pension plan. You. Okay. Bill, our four pension plans. Yeah. Last year, two years ago, we negotiated three-year contracts with all of our unions. That included no increases for three years. That took $32 million off the unfunded pension liability in the city. Because they, as you mentioned, because they're attached that the active employees raise goes to the retirees as a COLA. Three zeros resulted in $32 million being taken off the unfunded pension liability in the city. Our pension form, uh, our pension plans is outperforming the state bank this year. Our rate of return is much higher, which we, oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay. John, do you have a question? Yes, I'm going to go to uh, airport uh, at the moment uh, for both candidates. Uh, Warwick has always had a love of relationship with Green Airport. Uh, businesses from hotels to restaurants, not to mention car rentals, and shipping companies depend on the airport and their taxes broaden the tax base. Yet, due to the growth of the airport, the city has lost more than 400 homes. Now, playing fields are being relocated, residents have to put up with noise, and more than 1,500 acres, which could be generate, generating taxes, is not. Do you feel this is a beneficial relationship? And if not, how would you change it? And this is for both for both candidates. Maybe we'll start this time with the mayor. We'll do 90, 90, and then 30, and 30. Um, well, obviously, there is a beneficial relationship between the airport and, and the city. Um, the hotels that we have here in the city would not be here if it wasn't for the airport. And the businesses that have grown up in city center and Warwick would not be here if it wasn't for the airport. But as, you're, you, as you said, John, it's been a torturous relationship at times. Um, in the last few years, the relationship has been much, much better. And I credit uh, a lot of that to Dr. Kathleen Hitner, the former chair of the Airport Corporation, who lives in Moore and sits down at the table with us to figure out what we can do to get through the tough issues that were pending before us. So if you remember, the initial plan that the airport had was to um, take out the intersection of Post Road and, and Airport Road. Uh, it was to realign Main Avenue uh, and to change uh, countless areas all up and down Post Road. In the end, the development and the, and the plan that came into fruition um, allowed Airport Road and Post Road to stay the same. Very little change on Main Avenue. In fact, the new Main Avenue would be safer and better for people with uh, better road surface and turning lanes and all of that. So it, it, it's a difficult relationship. In a perfect world, I'd love that we had a pilot program for that, but that's exempted from the state. Um, and so if I was going to change anything, I would look for the state to put the airport into the pilot program. Thank you. <coughs> Same question, please. Uh, when I'm out on the campaign trail and I'm speaking with the homeowners that live in and around the airport, there's a lot of frustration. And uh, what they keep expressing to me is that uh, when, they, when we take a look at sound quality control in these homes, we take a look at some homes that had uh, sewer construction uh, installed and people are leaving their homes because uh, they can't afford that. So it's not just, revenue is not decreasing. We don't have revenue loss from uh, the homes that we're losing and the people that are deciding to leave in and around the airport. Uh, the concern is air quality. 
Uh, we have people who are concerned with noise quality, and we have homeowners that feel that if a home 300 feet away from them is, is getting so uh, quality soundproofing and they're not, that's where the frustration is. So uh, what, I, what I would do as mayor is I would form a committee that would uh, meet with the taxpayers in and around the airport and listen to, listen to their concerns and um, also work with the state and making sure, we have to also make sure that uh, DEM is in compliance as well, and uh, I would take a close look at that. Thank you. Um, and now, if you choose, <coughs> 30 more seconds. Um, I would just say, John, that as you've reported for many years, the relationship between the city and the airport has sometimes been very strained. Um, I think that the existing relationship that is there at the moment um, is really paying economic dividends. There's a lot of cooperation between the airport and the city now. Our police and fire departments are, are working on a cooperative basis. We are part of the TF Green marketing plan that they are doing, and we have made TF Green a part of our marketing plan. I think that we have seen uh, a major shift in the relationship between the city and the airport. Ms. Petrie, 30. Uh, we we have we've had a the mayor's had a lot of strains over the 14 years he's been in office. He's had strains with the state. He's having strains with uh, this with the school system, and uh, I, I think that it's important. You know, my priority as mayor is uh, definitely to develop relationships and and have immediate communication and and regular meetings not only with the citizens of Warwick who have concerns but in making sure that I never have relationships that are strained uh, throughout my tenure as mayor. Thank you both. Uh, Ms. Petrie, there was a, a situation earlier this year when an employee at the, in the City Hall wanted to run for United States Senate against Jack Hughes. Mm -hmm. And there's a city ordinance that prevents a person in a non-classified position from uh, running for office. There was, uh, as mayor, would you have uh, taken a position on that, and uh, what would you have done about that? We're talking about Republican Ray McKay. Yes. And um, as a fellow Republican, and as mayor, I would have done ev everything in my power to make sure uh, that I could see Ray McKay run against Senator, Democratic Senator Jack Reed. And, um, you know, it was uh, a lot of it had to do with the mayor claiming there was no control. It's what the charter dictated. And uh, um, I think that um, where there's a will, there's a way. And um, I would have, again, I, we saw the mayor do everything that he could to prevent Ray from, from running. And uh, that's not something that I would have done. Bill, just to clarify, that question was for, for Ms. Petrie. So we have 90 seconds for the mayor. Respond well, no, I, I mean, I expect to get that. Okay. I mean, what, well, no, I have a response. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, the charter does say that somebody in the classified service cannot run for political office. However, um, our legal team sat down with Ray McKay and offered him a leave of absence in order to allow him to run for office, and he turned that down. The only other option at that point was to get the city council to change the ordinance. Um, at one point, there was, in fact, um, someone who was willing to sponsor uh, that change, and there was no second on that. Um, as they tried to look to see who would sponsor and who would be supportive of that legislation, um, there was very little support on the almost all Democratic City Council to change the charter for that. But we offered him a leave of absence, and he did not accept it. I, I would um, I would challenge the leave of absence claim, and I would also challenge uh, if it was uh, left up to the city council for someone to sponsor it. I'd like to know who it was left up to and why it why it didn't go before the city council. Um, I wish the airport question were on cue right after. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. Uh, then, um, Bill, did you have anything else on that topic? Or no, no, no. Uh, this is a question uh, for Stacia. Uh, I've seen you at council meetings, and I know you have an interest in Warwick issues. Uh, what I'd like to hear is uh, whether, you, whether your decision to run for mayor was influenced by a core, core group of people that regularly attend council meetings, some of whom are Democrats, and what role they are playing in your campaign. Uh, how would you classify yourself as well as a Republican? conservative, moderate, liberal, Tea Party, 
And then part of that political question, which obviously applies to the mayor as well, who do you support for governor? And would you support your opponent should he or she, in the case of the mayor, uh, you know, win the primary? I, I think uh, I'm very proud that I am working with a group of people, and it's across all political spectrums. And the reason why we're able to come together, I have conservative, fiscal conservative values. I tend to be more liberal, liberal with social issues. But I think it speaks volumes when I have a team of individuals that are helping me and that support me. And, and we differ. But the, it, as far as um, where our ideas lie, but where we come together is on our fiscal conservatism. And that is something that I picked up on when I was attending city council meetings and I, could, I saw that I could relate to these individuals simply for what they stood for and how they were expressing their concerns on how our taxes, we were just getting killed in Warwick with taxes. 14 years of tax increases and we see what's happening, what it's giving us, it's giving us nothing in return. We see everything uh, crumbling around us. And I, I think it's important that we have to go outside of everything that I'm looking to do. It benefits all work citizens across all political spectrums. And um, you asked me who I support for governor, uh, and I've said it before, and I'll say it again, I support Ken Block. And I support Ken Block because I like the fact that he's an outsider just like I am. And he's all about uncovering waste and fraud, as I am. And um, I can truly relate to that, and I respect that. And uh, as far as supporting the mayor, if I lose this primary, I've said it before and I'll say it again. My answer is I would not support the mayor because um, I don't feel that the mayor represents 14 years of tax increases and sinking the city of Warwick okay. into massive debt is not a, not a Republican okay. value. And give you a little extra time because there's more of that question. The first mm -hmm. part was specifically to you, um, Mayor. So I, obviously the first part of the question is not for me. So let me go to, um, I will tell you that I'm a moderate Republican. I think I've been able to show over 14 years an ability to bring Democrats and independents to the table to be able to solve major issues for the city. Um, I've never had uh, a Republican majority on the council to work with, so I've always had to work with the opposite party in order to make things work. Um, I endorsed Alan Fung uh, as a fellow mayor. Uh, and as uh, a colleague in government, uh, I also in the past have worked with Ken Block when he was the head of the moderate party, looking to end one party domination at the state house, and I consider both of them very good friends of mine. Um, as to the last part of the question, I support the Republican nominee for mayor. I've been a Republican since I was a teenager. I was the chairman of the Rhode Island Young Republicans. I was the vice chairman of the state party. And I have been to every, I've been a delegate or an alternate to every Republican national convention since 1984. So I have always supported uh, every Republican running for mayor and would do so even if I lose a run. I, I, I think uh, it really it's, it's not a matter of who supports who, it's a matter of the numbers. And again, uh, re Republican values mean smaller government, it also means fiscal conservatism. And we again, we have not seen that in the 14 years with Mayor Abadijan who has increased the taxes 14 straight years in a row. He has not done one thing over 14 years to do uh, cut spending on the side of the city and it's the taxpayers that are bearing this very great burden. And that is why I, I, could, not, I could not support him as and a Republican. I think, Bill, your question, if I'm John, your question is about Republicanism. So um, I'll remind people that I started as a teenager working for John Chafee. And over the years, I've worked for and campaigned for um, political officials such as Lila Sappensley, Ron Makeley, Claudine Schneider, Lincoln Almond. I worked in Lincoln Almond's campaign and in his office. Um, there is a good brand. Um, of republicanism that has flourished in the state of Rhode Island, and I am proud to be a public. Okay, um, we're, we're near the, the end here. There's a quick question, uh, particularly to the mayor, since we've seen a couple directed to uh, the station. Well, how about uh, the, uh, the system of government? Would you prefer that the mayor appoint school committee members? Um, Bill, I've, I've thought about that for a while. I think that the, the system needs to change. Now, the city council had a, a hybrid system that they were looking at, and it never got 
um, passed to send up to the General Assembly. But they have, uh, they were thinking about a hybrid system where the mayor would appoint uh, three members, the council would appoint four members, the mayor's appointees would have to come with certain qualifications and would have to get council ratification. Um, I think that there's some merit to that, but in at this point, the system that we have is an independently elected five-member school committee. And Mr. Speaker? No. Yes. I think the school committee members uh, should be, we have to take a look at um, both the city side being elected from the city and on the school side as well. And uh, I, I think what's crucial is that there be a clear line of communication between the, the city and the schools. And we haven't seen that as well. We've seen, we've seen a lot of blame and finger pointing um, and the mayor has found this need to uh, use an executive order to create a nine member committee to have oversight over, over the, the schools uh, but that's not something, that's not the approach that I, I would take, but um, so that's right. Thank you. And so now it's uh, time for our closing statements and, and for the order determined uh, before uh, the debate. Uh, we start with uh, Mayor Adhesion. Thank you, John. Thank you uh, to John Marion, John Howell, and Bill Rappoli for putting together this debate today. Uh, and first and for foremost, I want to thank everyone who was here and everyone who attended. Strong, decisive leadership is more than creating pie charts and graphs at your kitchen table. In the time that I have been mayor, we have posted surpluses nearly every year. We have been paying down the city's bonded indebtedness, and we are investing in our future by preserving and protecting Rocky Pool. We have the only pension plans in the state that are listed in Tier 1. We have been named as one of the best communities to do business in, one of the best communities to live in, and one of the safest communities in this country. So I ask for your support and your vote in the September 9th Republican primary. Let's keep Warwick moving in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Abadijan, for participating in the debate. John Howell from the Warwick Beacon, Bill Rapley from Channel 10, and John Mary from Common Cause for asking such insightful questions. This campaign has not been easy for me. I've had to balance my career, family, and planning a wedding. I want to thank my fiance Jay for his patience and understanding and support and especially for rescheduling our honeymoon. But most importantly, I want to thank the citizens of Warwick for showing their support on Facebook, to those that donated to the Stacia for Mayor campaign and to those that attended the meet and greets. Thank you to the supporters that are advocating on my behalf with campaign lawn signs and speaking to their neighbors, family, and friends, and to those who were gracious to invite me into their homes and businesses on the campaign trail to share with me their concerns as well as their hopes for the city of Warwick. I promise you that as mayor, I will proudly take on the challenges to lead the city of Warwick into a new direction. To summarize my plan, I will rebalance Warwick spending priorities and stop the endless cycle of 14 years of tax increases. I will establish a dialogue with the schools and the school department to repair our crumbling schools and restore programs such as ALAP for gifted children. I will also establish a road repair program and I promise you that I will work full time as mayor and I will not accept any state appointed board or commission chairmanships. So many of you have told me that you want term limits and 14 years is too long for any politician. So many of you have shared with me that you are tired of 14 straight years of tax increases. You have the power in the hands to make the changes you ask about. I respectfully ask, I ask you for your vote in the Republican primary on September 9th. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me via the Stacia for Mayor Facebook page or email the campaign at Stacia for Mayor at gmail.com or please give us a call at 401 295 1020. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to just do a few quick thank yous. I wanted to thank the audience and give you a chance to, to applaud and, and um, Thank you so much for coming today uh, and giving your time to this. I want to thank everybody who's watching online uh, for taking the time uh, to be an informed voter. I want to thank uh, Channel 10, WJAR, and Warwick Beacon for sponsoring this and asking me to uh, help participate. And I want to urge everyone, no matter who you support, uh, to go out on September 9th uh, and exercise your right in our democracy. So thank you, everybody.